You can go to the YouTube and find uh, Whiskey Women Part 1. And that will be the beginning of it. Now, before we get into that, I wanted, I do want to bring up a few things. First, we had uh, on the podcast today, we had Neil Giraldo. Now, Neil is an iconic, very important musician. He is somebody who has influenced everyone from uh, Rick Springfield uh, to his wife, Pat Benatar. He is basically one of the most awesome guitarists in the game. He is um, he is such, such a personality, too. Now, we had him on the show because he, he actually he started a whiskey, but he... But he's very knowledgeable about whiskey as well. And his grandfather was a moonshiner. And he talked a little bit about how he would have to uh, truck along uh, moonshine in Cleveland. So if you are someone from the Cleveland area, I think you'll get a real kick out of this. Uh, thanks, Alan, for saying that you're glad to see uh, part two come on so quickly. And when I said I, I had it you know, ready to go, I meant it. So I don't, I don't mess around here. Now this uh, th this show is uh, definitely definitely Im important for me. As many of you know, I wrote the book uh, "Whiskey Women: The Untold Story of How Women Save Bourbon, Scotch, and Irish Whiskey." It is my opinion that we cannot do enough to improve diversification in the distilling community. While we have made great strides in the past ten years. We should not forget that before that book came out and before I was, uh, when I was out researching it, there were distillers who would not recognize the women in their, in their history. And now we're starting to see it in the African-American space. You know, for a long time, distillers would not recognize the former enslaved people who had contributions to, to whiskey. That's changing in a big way. And I would like to see that continue to change because we need, we need the, the whiskey community should be as diverse as society. And we need to be inclusive. That is not a political message. That is a matter of that's where things are right now. We need to recognize the former enslaved people as Americans and people who had contributions to the distilling community. The same as we have started to recognize women. Now, this is a very, very important segment, in my opinion, because you get to hear from four great women who have paved the road for other women in the distilling community. Now, these, this uh, session took place in uh, February 2016 at the Kentucky Derby Museum as a part of my Legend series there. And it includes uh, then Marianne Eves, or then Marianne Barnes, now Marianne Eves, uh, who was with uh, Castle and Key. She's no longer with them. She's a consultant now and a new mama. Hope she's hope she's doing well, Mar Marianne. I'm a big fan of Marianne and what she's doing. It includes Andrea Wilson, uh, Master of Maturation for Michters. Pamela Howman, who was then the Master Distiller for Michters. And Victoria McCray Samuels, who's the Vice President of Operations for Makers Mark. Now, if you didn't hear their stories in the first episode, I'll be providing a link into the uh, show comments so you can make sure you see uh, episode one. But because this was, a, this, if you put them all together, this was two hours long. I couldn't sit and watch a YouTube for two hours, so I didn't imagine that you could either. So I split it up into two parts of what I thought was a good place to cut it. And here we have, ladies and gentlemen, the second part to my uh, Whiskey Women Seminar at the Kentucky Derby Museum in 2016. Please enjoy. See and experience uh, the coopering of the barrels. Very nice. Andrea, you've got a, a really uh, cool distinction. You were the very first woman to hold the title of chairman of the Kentucky Distillers Association. Chairwoman. Chairwoman. <laughs> You were, how long have you been holding on to that? You couldn't wait. Just wait. Couldn't wait. 
I love it. So that, uh, for those who don't know, the Kentucky Distillers Association is the, um, they promote and protect the, the industry. It's a trade organization. And people who are competitors sit in a room and try to do things for the common good of the, of the industry. And it's closed off. I've never seen the bylaws. I've never been to a meeting, despite numerous requests to go. Um, so t what, is, what is a KDA meeting like? Um, so uh, what is it like? Well, it's, um, first of all, there's a lot of camaraderie amongst us in the industry. Um, I think it's one of the most special things about Kentucky bourbon is that, yes, we are all competitors, and yes, if you ask our marketing and sales teams, you know, it, it, you get a very different, you know, reflection because there's a very different focus. But when it comes to actually producing Kentucky bourbon, great Kentucky bourbon, there's a camaraderie in this industry that is like no other. And we come together for the protection and the growth of this industry collectively. So we will sit and we will talk at length about the strategy for the future, how we're gonna to continue to grow this industry, grow the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, how we're gonna partner with you know, various um, you know, vendors, suppliers, people in our communities, how we're gonna um, you know, support our communities, how we're gonna support our government, how um, we need to leverage our government to help us grow you know, internationally. So there's quite a lot of really rich conversations that happen um, within the Kentucky Distillers Association that influence um, big outcomes and big futures for not just this industry, but for the state of Kentucky and for everybody who lives here. So um, I'm really proud uh, Michter's um, is actually now a heritage member Mm -hmm. within the Kentucky Distillers Association, so we're really proud of that um, distinction, and we've worked really hard to get there. That means you have a vote uh, yes. on, on the future, and that's the first uh, new uh, distillery uh, added since, what, the 1980s? Since Heaven Hill was yes, added in the that's 80s? that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, staying on to your, your career, you... Uh, worked at Diageo uh, in a very different capacity. You're, you're there kind of managing uh, the warehouses and the facilities there. But you, you also got a, a knack for, for older whiskeys, and that's become a trend of late. Um, the next product we will taste, we, we don't have it up here yet, so I'll, I'll hold off <laughs> on, uh, on, on pu pushing on the tasting. But talk about, like, uh, the trend of of older bourbons, because 20 years ago, nobody wanted uh, a 15 to 25 year old age stated, age stated bourbon. Now, we can't get enough of it, and in fact, you probably know better than anyone the shortages of uh, bourbon that's older than you know, 10 years old. Talk about a little bit about, you know, from your experience, of what you've seen from a, 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 a consumption trend of people wanting older bourbons? Yeah, um, I, I can honestly say um, probably 10 years ago, I mean, you know, it doesn't seem like that long ago, 10 years. 10 years ago, nobody cared about anything over eight years old. <laughs> I mean, they're just, and, and, you know, I'm not being disrespectful in any way by telling you, but you know, a lot of old whiskeys that were sitting out in warehouses, sadly, you know, were being blended off or they were being sold. Blended off, like as into like Seagram's? Like a Seagram's American whiskey no, blend or? Just, uh, just being utilized as, as a flavoring tool. Okay. Right? So, right. you know, to help you, you know, manage uh, consistency of product and consistency of profile and things like that. It just wasn't something. Um, valued, you know, people, you only value what, you know, consumers want and consumers weren't demanding that at that time. Now, you know, what's happened is there's been this tremendous growth of super premium whiskeys 
um, and even you know luxury um, whiskeys, where people, much like you know the Scotch industries, they really value the age of products and they value what the barrel contributes to the to the whiskey as it's aging, and they value um, the selection process and. Um, all of these wonderful, beautiful things that have been happening, but I think a lot of that has come through, you know, with the growth of American whiskey has also come the growth of education about Kentucky bourbon and, you know, what it has to offer and the complexity and the rich profiles and, and the differences between, you know, the products that we offer and people starting to understand well, what do I like? You know, what's relevant to me? And um, I think there's a big, rich conversation to have in that, but I think that certainly, you know, from my perspective, over 10 years, it's been, you know, significant change mm -hmm. um, from, from where we were 10 years ago. Pamela, you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think Andrea did an excellent job on that. And, and to know, I mean, she, She's an integral part of that, of the KDA, um, and yeah. that's a really important organization for the industry, for all of us. Yeah, fighting for uh, tourism, fighting for uh, decreasing of you know taxes. So you guys are doing definitely doing a lot. Right. Uh, are you are you uh, have you all joined the KDA yet, or will you? I don't think we've written our check yet, but we do plan to be yeah. a member of the. KDA. Well, that's how it starts. It yeah. starts with a check. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a handshake and welcome to the club. Okay. We, we love those guys and we, we will be a member, yes. So Mary, I want to stay with, on topic of, of, of trends uh, with uh, what people are drinking. I'm seeing um, amongst um, uh, the new bourbon drinkers that there is an appreciation for, for full-bodied, like, younger bourbons. Uh, and you're going to be producing uh, new whiskeys soon. Uh, how, will you, how will you appeal to the modern bourbon palate with what you're doing there at the unnamed new distillery? <laughs> yeah, uh, soon to be named. Soon yeah. to be named. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I'm going to start calling it the soon to be named distillery. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking that question. So we are not going to be purchasing whiskey from other folks. Uh, the distillery was built by a man named Colonel E.H. E. Taylor, and he was a, a force behind the Bottle and Bond Act. So just to give you all a little bit of history on the Bottle and Bond Act, it was um, a, a legislation that created a set of regulations that you had to follow as a distiller. So before 1897, you could buy barrels of whiskey and, and sell them under your own label or, you know, it really would just be barrels back then. But Colonel Taylor was a, a strong-willed uh, person, individual. He was very tied in into politics and he was a banker and turns out he wasn't very good at either one of those, but he was an excellent distiller. So he wanted to bring authenticity and trust and quality to uh, the bourbon industry. And by uh, pushing for this Bottle and Bond Act, that's exactly what he did. Everybody had to start bottling their whiskey in glass at 100 proof. You had to um, be made by the same distiller, produced in one distilling season. There are two distilling seasons in a year. Um, a, a long list uh, to add to the current bourbon regulations and um, just creating that, that need for trust. So if we bought whiskey from somebody else, Colonel Taylor would roll over in his grave, and that's certainly not what we're trying to achieve by rebuilding and bringing back to life his iconic bourbon distillery. So I get the, the opportunity to build new brands, um, yeah. develop new flavor profiles. I have a, a history of making some excellent whiskeys, and of course they always had really excellent aged stock ready. Uh -huh. um, and you're right, the bourbon consumer and really all whiskeys, they're interested in the maturation process. What happens to the barrel? What does it taste like at a year? What does it taste like at two years? 
Um, how do we predict what it's going to taste like in five, six, nine, ten, twenty years? So being able to release products younger is something that that people are really looking forward to, and I'm really excited about being able to, you know, select the barrels that make it onto the shelf so that people get, you know, the best impression of of what our future is going to be, and. Our, our main product will be a bottle and bond, so bourbon, we won't have any traditional bourbon before four years. Uh, we'll be making a weeded bourbon, a rye whiskey, and a malt whiskey. And we talked about rye as a grain being more flavorful. You can release it a little bit younger because of the flavor of the grain. It, it holds up a little bit better. And it's um, not that corn is distasteful, but it's, a, it's more it's like... So moonshine is really saturated in the market, and moonshine is, well, illegal moonshine is corn and, and just white sugar, so it's got that particular flavor profile. And um, Kentucky whiskeys are very high in corn. A rye whiskey is high in rye, and r r people tend to appreciate, you know, rye grain in its raw state better than corn in its raw state. I would just kind of make that connection for you all. So rye younger release yes we're looking at that and then also malt whiskey as a younger release and potentially some uh weeded bourbon too we'll just see what okay. it tastes like Not and a gin too anything. right you're you're making a gin yeah absolutely okay. gin will be the the first product on the shelf mm -hmm. so it will be made from the uh, new distillate whether it be bourbon rye wheat weeded bourbon or or malt still playing with all of that and it's been really fun to do i made two batches of gin and a batch of bourbon this morning awesome yeah Little tiny batches, a liter. Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't have our starts. stills hooked it's up it's yet. Where it starts. It's where it starts. But the still, the everything is in close to being approved and set up. Everything is close, or well, for the big still to get fired up. The still is in. You know, we have to get everything hooked up to it before mm -hmm. we can actually run it. So we're, we had a gas line run two miles to get to us. It was run on coal forever, and you know nobody had made whiskey there since 1972, so it had very few modern upgrades. So we're building a, a lot of modern infrastructure in a very old shell using really some old um, equipment too. It was interesting when uh, my partners first went to go see the site of old, the former Old Taylor Distillery. It looked like post-apocalyptic, um, you know, so what the world looks like when humans have left. Uh, the plants were grown up over your head. I mean, you literally needed a machete to get through the site to even see anything. So it's amazing to me that my partner, Will, who was the first one to go see the site, had the vision to say, I want to save this. I want to bring this site back to life. And then my partner Wes joined him, and they purchased the site um, a couple, two Aprils ago. I came on the following January, and we've just been rolling since then. Uh, they were still doing lead and asbestos abatement when I started, so <laughs> didn't get into the buildings all that much. Most of the work was exterior as you might have seen from some of the updates I've been giving. The gardens are beautiful. The inside is still shaping up. So we've done a really good job at, at tearing things apart and, and um, taking out old pipes to put in new ones and you know, sandblasting everything. There are some massive fermentation tanks that are made out of core tin steel, which is great. They're in great shape, um, still really thick. So core tin is weathering steel. It rusts to a point to create a protective layer, and then you know it just stays in, in shape. Yeah. So core tin steel, we sandblasted everything, and we're adding in some new modern technology, like the cooling coils and agitators, instead of using air to agitate. But I'll, I could talk about this all day. But <laughs> long story short, we're going to be making gin, and we're going to be making it from scratch, like just like Colonel Taylor would have wanted. It's awesome. We'll be talking more about some uh, some uh, old Taylor. Someone brought uh, an impossible to find bottle. Did, did you all do that? No, we're not. We're not. We're not doing that yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but soon. But soon after. Uh, staying on the topic of uh, uh, aged uh, whiskey, we honored a fellow by the name of Bill Samuels Jr., who brought in a couple bottles of Maker's Mark 12-year-old which does not exist, 
and did not exist, doesn't exist anywhere, but the people who uh, participated in the Legend series got a taste of it. And Bill could not believe how much we all liked it. And because he's got this bias against the uh, older whiskeys. And anyone here remember that? That fine taste? It was pretty nice, right? It was pretty good. And so is there, is there a plan on the, you don't have to answer this, but. <laughs> remember that Bill, Bill Jr. and Bill Sr. and Marge had a bias against that. And, and they had that bias for a reason. And I think, you know, Mary Ann spoke well about wheat ages differently than corn or rye does. And does. one of the things, if you come to the distillery, we do have an eensy little bit of that 12 year at the distillery. And what I do is. Is it I available to purchase? No, sir. Oh, okay. It's only available to demonstrate things, Fred. Okay. Um, and what it allows us to demonstrate is if you come in for a tasting, you, you will taste the new distillate off the still, and you will notice that it goes everywhere in your palate. And when you have nice, fresh samples with their little lids on, and we can just sit and focus, it, it, it kind of brings the story to life a little bit more um, than just an isolated glass of it. But then you can taste the immature maker's mark and where that falls in your palate. And it's generally everywhere. It'll kind of fall in the middle of your tongue, kind of to the back of your palate in the front. But when you taste fully matured maker's mark, it's very forward in the palate. Okay, so it falls at the tip of your tongue, right where your sweet receptors are. If you let maker's mark age over the prime years, which is roughly around six months, depends on the, I mean six years, it depends on the actual lot. I'm going to say breaking news seasons. here, Maker's Mark is six, six months years. old now. <laughs> six years. If it goes much beyond that and you taste it, you'll notice it starts going backwards again. Now, there's no denying that if you nose those two samples together, the nose of the older whiskey is, is, is much fuller. It's got it's got a lot of more complexity than fully matured Maker's Mark. And you know the people that really enjoy that part of the tasting are scotch drinkers because it kind of brings to life that, that, those blending notes and those qualities and those flavor profiles. Um, so I didn't really answer your question. That's okay. I'm just saying um, next time you guys are in those meetings. About, I was kind of explaining about the bias. Um, Next time you're in those meetings, just say, you know what, this 12-year-old might be something. I'll you know? let Bill bring that up. <laughs> but but here, is the, here is the thing. Our, our fans um, and our brand fans and our, and our loyalists and the makers, the people that enjoy Maker's Mark, um, right now what we are working to is satisfy the needs of those customers and meet the needs of those customers. So uh, I only have that little bit so for don't, tasting Victoria, don't only. go hating on, on older whiskey. It's really good. It's making a comeback. <laughs> and actually, Andrea, would you, would you walk us through what I think is? I'm hoping I got the right one here. Uh, what I what I've uh, is one, been one of the best new bourbons like of the last like six. This was released in September. When was this released? Last last fall. This was last fall. Last fall. Yeah. So this was one of my favorites of the uh, of uh, of the fall release. But take us through the uh, Michter's ten year old bourbon. Yep, so this is Michter's 10. Now, um, what you should know is that uh, Michter's business philosophy, Willie Pratt's our master distiller, and um, we don't get to bottle whiskey until Willie says it's ready to bottle. And, you know, that's not some kind of, you know, gimmick or something like that. It's really true. And, you know, we sit around in tasting panels and we take out samples and they'll sit there and you know, Willie will go through, and I mean, honestly, I've seen him do this. He'll just sit there and he'll go, I don't like any of them. And, you know, we all just kind of sit there and go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's very sad news, <laughs> you know, because there's such a clamoring. You know, people want some of these aged whiskeys. And um, so we were very fortunate last year. Um, Willie said, Yep, I think we've got a winner in here, and we tasted, and sure enough, we were all very, very happy with this release. Um, so I, I too, am not going to give you the tasting notes, but what, what's kind of nice is that it's been sitting there for a bit now, so um, I think you'll experience, have maybe a little different experience than when we first poured it, because what's interesting about these older whiskeys as they sit and they oxidize, you will get different flavor profiles. As you taste them, different characters will start to come out. They will nose differently. They will taste differently. 
And, and that's one of the things that's really um, exciting about some of these older whiskeys. So cheers. Cheers. And for the record, you guys, if you try to find this in the store right now, you won't be able to find it. So I, I, this is this is one. Of, it's very highly allocated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it sold out as soon as it hit the stores. Does it still taste as good as you remembered, or is it uh, is it changed? Or do you have some do you have new thoughts on this this product? Um. Well, I really love this one because it has some characters in it that, um, for me, everybody's palate's different, and I have certain sensitivities to certain things, and fruity is one of them, so there's some real fruit characters in here, caramel, um, you know, there, there's kind of a, yeah, it's almost like a deep, dark, almost like toffee chocolate. Yeah. flavor to it that that is really intriguing for me um we've had people tell us you know banana and things like that mm -hmm. I, I don't personally get, don't get those that. as much but um there's a there's a real almost like a um like a raisin character to me that i really that resonates with me but that's one of my sensitivities i know that in my palate so um, that's what's kind of fun for me about tasting whiskeys is you really, the more you taste, the more you learn about your palate, you understand what things that, um, you know, really resonate for you. Um, I'm not very good as a taster as probably some of my colleagues up here because one of my issues has always been that I um, associate. So whiskey for me is very much about the experiences that I've had in my life. And so a lot of times when I'm talking about whiskey, you know, I'm like, oh, this reminds me of when I did something, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I think that's really um, one of the things that intrigues me about whiskey and that I'm so passionate about it is because it's such a celebratory spirit. You know, it's, it's a lot of things that happen in your life. And um, it seems like in my life anyway, whiskey's <laughs> always somehow been a part of that. So anyway, but I hope you enjoyed it. We hope to have another release this year of the 10-year bourbon, so we're excited about that. Another 10-year-old bourbon release? Yes. Is it, will, yes. will it be in the fall or mm. in the spring? We think it might be coming in the spring, Fred. Okay. So, nice. Yeah, so we're excited about and that. And you just had the 10-year-old rye released. Yes, the 10-year yeah. rye is releasing March 1st. So if everything goes well, we hope to have a 10-year bourbon behind it. Victoria, any new products for... Maker's Mark. I mean, so you've got the regular Maker's Mark. You got the uh, cast strength and the Maker's Forty Six. Mm -hmm. uh, and we the do have cast strength Forty Six in very small, in little bottles, mm -hmm. little Forty Six for sale at the at Maker's Mark. And again, and cast strength means straight out of the barrel. Cast strength is also there at, yep. and it kind of brings you back to what it's like, right in the barrel and and back to the the foundation of the brand. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, trends with with women in uh, consumption of whiskey because this is this seems to be the uh, the one area that everybody wants to talk about in, you know in terms of the mainstream media uh, in the last in the last three years I've been on CBS this morning NPR all these places just talking about women drinking whiskey and it just seems to me like it's a, kind of a little overblown a little bit, but do you, are you all past that? I mean, are you tired of hearing it? I don't want to say are you tired of hearing it, but are, can we move past in terms of like the mainstream narrative of women are drinking whiskey now? Would you like that? You would. Marianne, you're like, <laughs> I yes. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious that, that women enjoy whiskey and women have always enjoyed whiskey. It's just now more women are finding each other and forming groups, the bourbon women, whiskey women, whiskey chicks. There's many. Um, and the media has caught on to that too. So it's, it's not a curiosity really, but people are, are curious about it. I... I 
look, we've talked about this many times, Victoria, and you're, you have you come from the stance of like, well, I don't want to say your stance. So what, what is your, what's your thought on the, this narrative of, of women drinking whiskey? I think that what, what's so different about that? You know, there's, there's lovely bourbons out there, there's, there's lovely whiskeys out there, there's different, you know, all across the board, distilled spirits um, enjoy, to be enjoyed by people. Um, you know, to Marianne's point, it seems to be a bit of a novelty, and I get the privilege of traveling uh, across our country and even internationally, and I, I speak to different women's groups, you know, and it's like, this is so wonderful, we can actually speak about this, we can learn about this, we can talk about this. Um, it is, it's more of finding an audience, finding an opportunity, and I really think it's reflective of everyone because we see our visitors come in, and whether it's men or women, they're all interested in understanding and learning more about the product. Um, is it still a novelty? Yes, I think it is. Um, I think we kind of have to be frank with that. Is it, do we need to keep treating it like a novelty? Not really, um, we can kind of just learn what the good spirits are, read some good books about it, realize that, you know, it, it's an engaging topic and, it, and it's a great opportunity to enjoy a different product. So. I'd highly encourage the reading the books part. <laughs> I know a few. You know, uh, so you what didn't the, set me up for that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the reasons why I, I think that continued to come up was, was flavored whiskey mm -hmm. and, and like, uh, some of these uh, investor calls, the CEOs and stuff would talk about like, this is how we're going to reach women. Mm -hmm. And so some of this was actually started by your parent company uh, in Beam Suntory and then, you know, Heaven Hill would do it and it was, and Diageo would do it. And so like, it was kind of like, some of it was self-inflicted in terms of, of that narrative, but I noticed something. They got pushback mm -hmm. that women of, of stature you know, women who were not just in college, but women who were professionals, mm -hmm. they were like, you know, don't target me with flavored whiskey. Mm -hmm. And I've seen like a change in, in how distilleries are handling the, the flavored whiskey category. Um, I mean, what are you seeing on the, from a pure trend perspective? I, I, I see women drinking bookers a lot more than I see them drinking uh, Fireball or Jack Daniels honey or something. Are you seeing more of a trend toward you know straight spirits uh, versus flavored whiskey? I am. You know, in hosting tastings and speaking with people, even when I travel, it'll it'll be the women that say, "I would like to try cast strength." I, that's really my favorite because it really gives me the full flavor profile. So I see a lot more of that. Less willing to mix it, but more an interest in enjoying the true spirit. So I actually mm -hmm. do see that. I mean, I think from my perspective too, one thing that I would just point out is I think the image of whiskey has changed dramatically. I think once upon a time, you know, the image of whiskey was kind of the tough guy, rough and tumble, you know, kind of beverage. And I think now there's um, very much a sophistication with the beverage that, you know, yeah, if you're a professional, it doesn't matter, you know, really what, um, you know, whether you're male, female, you know, or any of those kinds of issues play into it. It's just, you want a sophisticated beverage, something complex, something that, you know, you can sip on for a while and really enjoy and appreciate and all of those kinds of things. I think that that's really what's resonating a lot with the American whiskey category as a whole. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a place for flavored whiskeys, I mean, certainly they're hot, it's a trend, you know, all of those kinds of things are happening, but I also think that, you know, the, the movement of classic cocktails um, has also influenced, you know, it's not just about slinging drinks anymore, you know, and, and I don't mean to use a kind of slang term, but it's not like that anymore, you know, it's like you have these very sophisticated bartenders who are sourcing, you know, beautiful, fresh ingredients and they're you know muddling and they're taking all of this time to create this wonderful beverage um, that you know can now really be appreciated and it's not just appreciated for you know some sugary sweet syrupy cover up the whiskey mm -hmm. it's really the complement of 
you know, these ingredients with this whiskey and how beautiful an experience that can be for an individual. It's, it's an amazing thing, um, you know, really that's taken, I mean, there's a lot of artistry in that and it's an amazing yeah. thing that's happening. Pamela, how do you feel about the flavored whiskey category overall? Because you're a purist. I'm not a fan of flavored whiskeys myself, personally. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't drink them, um, but I, I, I'm sure there are people out there that like flavored whiskeys. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I've, I'd always, um, when I was at my previous um, status, um, I mean, to me, that was a target market for a, a younger person. I, and, and I think with social media and, and books, like Victoria um, indicated, that, that younger people are more educated now in the, the cocktail scene. And, and like Andrea said, the, the cocktails, it's all about the experience now. And they go out and have these, these delicious cocktails that complement the whiskeys. They want to taste the whiskeys. They don't want to cover them up. And, you know, personally, you know, I don't, I love cocktails. There's very few cocktails, though, that I like the products in. Why ruin a good thing? <laughs> And that is a great way to open this up for questions. A woman after my own heart. Now, we, we will have uh, something special for Marianne to taste, but you're, you'll be pouring it, correct? For, or some, someone will be pouring it. You'll be pouring it back there? They're coming around. Right? Oh, they're coming around now. They're with the glasses or for the pour? With the glasses. With the glasses. All right, so we're going to have something. This is very, very special. When it gets there, when we all get a glass, I'm going to let Mary Ann just talk about it. We're going to keep this discussion going. Um, you know what's happened? Let's just talk about a, a, a trend that's happening in the spirits category. You, remember, you all remember the series Sex in the City? That series was, was widely credited with uh, impacting the, the cocktail culture, and specifically vodka. But now vodka is starting to go down and American whiskey is, is going up. And, uh, yeah, right? Thank you. And my, my question for, really for everyone here, did you see this coming? I mean, because if you talk to some people, they're like, they were caught you know, flat-footed a little bit, they weren't ready for, they did not see this uh, incredible surge in American whiskey interest. The millennial generation has led the charge and some uh, old timers coming back to it. So did, did you see this coming it is from, a, from an industry person? Did you see this incredible interest and growth in American whiskey? I think what, what we saw was more and more people building on wanting to learn more about the product. You know, a, a kind of a tremendous interest in all things handcrafted, in all things that have a heritage, in all things understanding more of the complexity of it. Um, I think that was just, that's kind of the nature as you look at the different generations. Um, what became easy and quick sort of was just easy and quick and people did start. I mean, I would say that, I don't know if as an industry we predicted that we would quite see what we're seeing right now. I honestly don't know and probably Andrew can speak from a KDA industry standpoint. But at Makers, what we have seen consistently over the last several years are people wanting to learn more about things and cover up less and really engage in the conversation of pure whiskey. So maybe if we were on the lookout for it as an industry, we might have seen it. Mm -hmm. I think they want to know more about how it's made, why it's made, what it's made with, what do you do, how do you do it. I mean, I, I've had more, um, and I don't, I don't want to say intelligent, but but more complex questions about distilling and and asking um, about specific things in the distillation process that ten years ago I don't think anybody would even know. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they wouldn't even know that that even existed. I mean, I, I did every tour um, many years ago. My husband and I did a Kentucky visit, 
prior to moving here and um, did, did several of the tours and I didn't know anything and you know the types of questions that I you would hear and stuff but nowadays I mean you know if we have a visitor to our distillery the questions that they ask are are very intelligent and and very I mean they're knowledgeable everyone's knowledgeable they want to know how their product is made and and what's used and what's not used and what you do which I find really it, it's fun actually for me so, Andrea, as the chairwoman of the KDA, you take full responsibility for this resurgence as the former chairwoman, right? <laughs> of course, Fred, of course. <laughs> um, it is interesting, though, because um, back in, in 2009, when I was um, chairwoman of the KDA, one of the things that we did at that time is we did um, a strategy for growth and, um, you know, how we were going to continue to grow and build Kentucky bourbon. but. Um, you know, I can honestly say there was nobody sitting around the table who was talking about, you know, <laughs> the growth of American whiskey to the extent that we're seeing it today. I mean, you know, I know this figure is a little bit old, but from 2009 to 2013, you know, Kentucky bourbon, just from an export perspective, grew 99%. I mean, it's crazy. You know, it's crazy the numbers and the percentages of growth that we're experiencing. But, um, you know, even from the export perspective, the attraction of this American whiskey product is so powerful for some of the reasons like Victoria was talking about. You know, people are so engaged in the heritage, the history, the characters, the stories. They want to know more. Then that leads to like Pam was saying, they want to know how is it made, how is it, the, you know, the authenticity of the product. It's just this amazing thing that people are so attracted to. And, you know, hell, I'm attracted to it, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's the reality is that it's just so fascinating, you know, to be involved in. And it's, um, you know, a, as a spirits drinker, I mean, I just love whiskey. And it, it does, it's a very complex spirit. It's not like vodka or you know other products where you know it's like okay well I need something with this it can stand wholly on its own just fine and and be appreciated that way just fine and, and it's amazing spirit and then you get into you know all the different producers and all the the mash bills and the yeast and how each flavor profile can be different it's just it's phenomenal but I think generationally you know every generation has things that they want and mm -hmm. this generation wants something their own they want something that they can relate to and that you know represents them and their interests um, and I think that's different than maybe you know like my parents were you know it's crown royal we want crown royal we want crown royal <laughs> you know and that's that's just what we want you know I mean we had Kentucky bourbon in our house too but there was definitely, you know, an appreciation for certain spirits. And then, you know, you kind of come to my generation. It's sort of like, well, you know, I don't know. I'm excited about drinking, you know, my parents' drink. I kind of want something my own. So it's just different from generation to generation. I think that definitely plays a role in it as well. Well, Mary Ann, um, you are of the generation bringing us back. Uh, let's talk about one of the bourbons that brought, you know, was really important to bourbon at one point. This is, this is pretty special. What do, you, what do you have here for us tonight? So this is, just put this out there immediately. I did not make this, but you will not be able to get this. Um, it's, has anyone heard of a phenomena called dusty hunting? Can you guess what that might be? Dusty hunting. So Folks are scouring the United States, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's probably happening over across the, the seas too, but looking for old bottles of whiskey that have been sitting on shelves collecting dust because they were bottles that, you know, when the industry tanked, nobody wanted them. So there's all these really unique old bottles, very coveted product that people weren't buying, that people are now getting for a steal. A bottle that you might pay a hundred plus dollars for today from somebody that's putting it back on the market they're getting for eh, fifteen ten dollars 
So it's pretty incredible. So this, this is a found gem of older whiskey that the um, producer that ran um, Old Taylor after Prohibition, so Colonel, Colonel Taylor, the gentleman that built the Old Taylor Distillery, died during Prohibition. This is a post-Prohibition whiskey, so not something that Colonel Taylor made. Um, those are just extremely rare. <laughs> this one is still very rare, but not quite as rare. We did get our hand on a couple bottles to share with you all. So this is a, a six-year-old whiskey that would have been produced in the 80s. Um, a bottle, again, that just sat on the shelf forever. And uh, I, I want to taste it with you all. And it gave me the opportunity to crack open a bottle that. And this they is didn't this was to. old Taylor. This was old. Yes, this is old this is old Taylor product made by National mm -hmm. Distillers. So this would be this would be 86 proof, right? This is uh, 86 proof. 86 That's proof, six year old. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one thing that this particular brand in this era was known for is a sweetness, a butterscotch character, and a lot of people call it a or you know whiskey nerds and. Thing, call it a butterscotch bomb. Um, kind of one note, you'll get some um, oak to it too, but like these guys, I'll let you have, make your own uh, notes. So this is kind of all over the palate. I don't know what y'all are getting. It's nice and thick. I'm a fan. In fact, tasting some of these older releases really changed the way I felt about older whiskeys. When I first took the, the position at the former Old Taylor Distillery as master distiller, my partners had two bottles of whiskey that had been produced at that site, distilled in 1917. Yeah. They found them uh, in the back of some old uh, liquor cabinet at a horse farm. Um, probably someone stuck them back there and just forgot about them forever. But um, we were able to get our hands on them, and I nearly cut myself. It was the old metal screw cap, nearly um, shed blood to get into that bottle. But it, um, <laughs> it really changed the way I felt about older styles of whiskey because my opinion as a chemical engineer was that you know, they didn't have the technology to make a consistent product. They didn't have the science to monitor the process. How in the world could they be making um, anything of quality? And then I tasted it and I was like, I am wrong. And I can admit when I'm wrong and this is what I want to make. So <laughs> I've um, taken that sample, done some um, analysis to it, found out what the grain bill was, was able to identify what a similar um, genetic yeast to what they would have used would have been. So able to, to kind of decode it and make uh, give us the ability to make a very similar product. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. It's fun. It's very fun. Well, that leads us to the portion of our, uh, of our talk uh, to open it up for uh, questions uh, with the audience. We'll have a, a microphone right over here with raising hands. Uh, Fred, as always, over here, fine name, Fred, over here, there in the front, got a question for us. Uh, I've been re uh, reading recently about a stave program possibly uh, being put into effect at uh, Makers. Is th what's, what's that about? Well, one of the things that many distilleries offer is an opportunity to come to the distillery and actually select your favorite barrel. So, so you can purchase the barrel, you can have it bottled, you can share it with your friends and family, you can take it back to your business however you choose, choose to own that when you purchase it through a distributor. Well, one of the things that makes Maker's Mark unique is we rotate our barrels, which you probably know. So when the new distillate is put into the barrels, the barrels go on the top floor of the warehouse. They stay there for three summers or three years. We then pull samples and taste them and determine that they're ready to be rotated. They're then taken off the top floors and put in the lower floors of the warehouse. Now, what does that do in staying true to how Bill Sr. did that? It provides consistency. So we, don't, we always dump the barrels out of the lower floors, 
barrels taste the same throughout the warehouse, depending on where they're located, there's really no difference. So it provides a consistency. So it wouldn't really work to invite you to come into Maker's Mark and give you a few barrels and say, here, pick, pick one that's going to be your favorite that you want to choose with your friends and family, because you'll find them to be very, very consistent. So um, kind of with the inspiration of Maker's 46, adding an opportunity to take fully matured Maker's Mark and to finish it with seared staves of some sort that would impart a little bit more maker's character and kind of let the flavor wander just a little bit off but still always coming back to the same maker's finish. In that spirit, what we have looked at doing is selecting five unique staves, one of which is the stave that's currently used for Makers 46. And what we will be able to do is we will be able to offer the person or the business to come to Maker's Mark where they will be able to experience each of those in its pure state and then create a blend of numbers of staves. So you have 10 staves per barrel. Every Maker's 46 barrel is finished with 10 seared French toast staves. So for instance, you could come and you could say, I'd like two of these staves and one of these staves. And, and you get to select that. You get to cooper your own stave set. You get to put it in your barrel and then fill the barrel uh, back with fully matured Maker's Mark and then it will age in the lower story of the warehouse or now in our new cold storage cave, which is kind of intriguing and it makes you want to come see it, doesn't it? Um, for nine weeks, and then that will be bottled and, and offered as Maker's Private Select. You're welcome. We have a question over here. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in how the industry plans to educate the public on, um, well, I hear two counter uh, trends. The, the desire for an aged product or an even older product versus the age that it tastes the best, wheat, rye versus corn, and, and how the industry would educate the public on what is the best year to consume this product, or this rye, or this wheat? You're asking that question at a very crucial time, to be honest with you. Uh, we're in a moment where a lot of uh, age, age statements are dropping off of the label. Um, and, you know, they're to each his own. And a lot of time, you know, these, uh, these distilleries, they're businesses and they're trying often to maximize profits. And sometimes they get into a situation where if they keep that age on there, they either have to double the price, uh, which would make consumers angry, or they'll have to water it down, lower the proof, which as we learned with Maker's Mark a few years ago, made, it, made consumers angry. Uh, or you take the age statement off entirely so you'd no longer constrain to that particular age. There is, everyone has their own choice of, of, a, of a favorite age, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, some, like Maker's Mark, preaches taste. Um, and that's becoming more of the theme. And the issue. We're also seeing it in Scotch. So age statements are dropping across the board uh, in, in all whiskey categories. But I would also just add to that by saying, like in, in the um, example of Michter's 10-year, just because it has 10-year on the label doesn't mean it's 10-year in the bottle. It might be 12-year, it might be 13-year. It's what are, are, is best going to represent the quality of the whiskey. So while I agree there's a lot of changes happening in the industry, I think ultimately it's about what is really resonating with the consumer and what are they enjoying and what flavors do they like and all those th things and you know your question about the educational part i think that's what is such um, a powerful undertone in, in the state of kentucky right now is our kentucky bourbon trail which offers you know the opportunity for consumers to come from all over i mean we're you know a million visitors to the kentucky bourbon trail now 50 states, 50 countries being represented. People are coming from all over to learn about Kentucky bourbon and how do you taste it and you know what's different between a rye and a wheat and a corn and all these different things. And I, I think that that's only going to continue to grow. But you know, 
my personal and professional hope is is that it's Kentucky centric. You know that people continue to come to Kentucky to learn about Kentucky bourbon. Anything to add on that? On that? One more question over here. Yes. Or not just one more. More qu another question. Well, speaking about uh, uh, women's influence in, in bourbon and the uh, single barrel programs that, that people have where you can come into the distillers. I know uh, Four Roses does a lot of that. And I know Bourbon Women did a Four Roses batch and they selected a barrel. I, I enjoy a lot of those bourbons because they're bourbon, obviously. But um, mainly, that was one of my least favorite. And in speaking to uh, Peggy No, who used to be a, a master taster, she said it's interesting that you don't like it because 10 women selected that. And she said that women's palates may be different. I don't know that you could speak to that, but do you think that, that in, in, of course, my wife's was the same. She didn't enjoy it as much as some of the others. But do you think women sometimes do have a different palate than, than most men? Is that, who's that question for? Just, just in general? Women. <laughs> it's for the women. <laughs> Well, I, I'll uh, be happy to step in on that one. So we, we talked about women being um, very present in sensory. At Brown Foreman, for example, my former employer, most of the sensory scientists were women. And it is a scientific fact that women have better taste. I mean, better sense of taste. <laughs> so it, it's just a, yeah, and better taste too. It's the, the sense of smell um, really drives your sense of taste. And it, I think it's really a, a factor of evolution. So it's the females that were taking care of the kids and gathering the, the, the food. And, you know, you have to be, have a sensitive sense of smell to smell if there's something spoiled or rancid. And, toxic to your offspring so women have a better sense of smell and your sense of smell is three-fifths of your sense of taste and everybody's sense of taste is different so some women may not have as sensitive a palate as, as some men and everybody appreciates different food that's why there's you know a million different restaurants and they keep popping up in different places and different people order different things and different people enjoy different whiskeys some take it on ice some put a drop of water in it some you know really like myself personally every time I go into a new place I'm, I'm looking at the cocktail menu first because I'm obsessed with flavor and I want to see what that particular bartender did with you know whatever product they chose so I would say it's not a, a men and women thing per se I do think you know women, as kind of across the board, have more sensitive palates, but it doesn't mean that you know necessarily better or would appeal to more people better. If that answers your question, I think I saw a nod. Right, very good. <laughs> Got a question over here. Well, we're we're, uh, we're spacing the questions, so you know, so get the range of the room. Yeah, I'm from Bardstown, Kentucky. My mother was in the bourbon industry and transportation in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And of course, I've been around it all my life. And I'm seeing a big surge in warehouse construction. How do you handle, with this surge that's in bourbon, building the warehouses that looks like it's going on and not overbuild? How are you, are you all involved in that aspect of it? You know, how much? market we're looking at ahead and how much we need to produce, how much warehousing we need, because I'm seeing a lot of new warehouses. I didn't see any built for a long time, and now I'm seeing warehouses built in a lot of different areas. There's, um, there's no crystal ball for that, and if you find one, I'd be happy to buy it off of you for a good <laughs> price. <laughs> but, um, I mean, the reality is, is that you, you have to make a choice. So. Every business sits around and, you know, whiskey is a business where you have to be forward planning. So, you know, the stuff we're doing today, you know, we thought about many years ago. Um, so it's a bit of a uh, gamble in some ways, but you have to decide, are you going to take a conservative approach? Are you going to take a middle of the road? Or are you going to, you know, go for the gusto, you know, kind of thing? And there's, there's risk and reward in all of those categories. And you know, each individual business has to sit and they have to look at, you know, many different factors. You're looking at, you know, now global growth, you know, we're creating, 
brand ambassadors all over the world now um, for these products that we never had before. Um, you know, just kind of a baseline of brand ambassadors. We, you know, we have to think about, you know, what's happening um, in the market with trends. Um, you know, there's a lot that really goes into thinking about, and then all of that collectively then comes back to a conversation around, you know, capacity. And what's the capacity of your stills? What's the capacity of your warehouses? All of these different things. So, you know, just over the last several years, I think there's been over $600 million, you know, invested in the state of Kentucky alone just in building more capacity to be able to accommodate the growth in the future. So with capacity comes, you know, this now surgence, you know, in all the warehouses, because now that the assets are built, you know, you got to be able to lay down the product. But, um, you know, it, there's, there's no magic to it. And, you know, people have said for a long time, sales forecasts are never right. You know, we hope they are, but um, it, it's difficult. Victoria, you guys are always building something. <laughs> but in a thoughtful way. Yeah. <laughs> um, because what my responsibility is, kind of to that question, is to see to the daily operations and making sure that production is met in a quality way. Um, that never compromises the pillars of quality and heritage in our team. Um, that said, I am engaged with those that are experts. There are people that, while it isn't a hard and fast science, and there is no crystal ball, to Andrea's point, um, there are people that understand things like that and, and people that look at that for the business. And my own personal experience is that those, of, those folks in my business, my global business, they are very thoughtful. They sit down with makers and, and they, they are very thoughtful about planning out. Um, let's not, you know, get into a rush. Let's look at it carefully uh, and make the right decisions to still protect the brand and protect the integrity of the brand. So I agree. There's no crystal ball. And, you know, fortunately for me, there's people in the global organization that are far more expert at it than I am. Over here. With the manufacturing boom of uh, bourbon and you being a startup and the barrel shortage that is, you know, you're 18 months, 24 months out on barrels and there's some distilleries that buy, you know, roughly $50 million worth of barrels a year. How is this going to affect your startup ability? That's a great question. I have been very fortunate. I have a relationship with a new cooperage that's going to be opening in March. Uh, we won't be ready for barrels then, but they'll be producing them. Uh, it's a Scottish and French owned cooperage. They're just now getting into brand new bour bourbon barrels and it's because of the reason that you're saying. They see value there. There's definitely the, the demand there so they feel like they can supply. It's a Speyside cooperage, which has been for a long time uh, making the uh, majority of you know very high quality wine barrels in uh, Europe and now they've expanded their operations it's and it's going to be built in Ohio and which is not too far away but they've committed to being our, our sole partner and they want to provide you know all the barrels that we need so I've been very fortunate that that is not something not not one of the things that keeps me up at night although there are many <laughs> um, Fred I think we're gonna have one more question right here okay. this has the uh, GMO issue come up with your suppliers of the grain? Is that across the board? What, what was that? What was that? The GMO is genetically modified organisms. Ah, uh, uh, the grain. Yeah. What you want? Ever, you want everyone to answer that question? Yeah. Uh, you, you want to start over here with uh, you, the, you, the exact question? I didn't hear. I the, just heard the, the question GMO. was: um, Are you using GMO or non-GMO corn? Uh, for your production, and I, I assume he wants an explanation one way or of why. At Mictors, we're using non GMO corn, all non GMO corn. Um, we made that conscious decision. It was more expensive, but we decided that that, that was the way we wanted to go, and we've committed to that. I've been working with a farmer out of Adairsville and Danville, and they don't uh, really supply distillers right now. So 
I learned of them from a, another distillery, actually in Danville, Wilderness Trail. They bought a 50-pound bag of this Kentucky-grown rye, and that's about as far as their relationship went. But um, I, I learned that they got the rye, and I was like, oh, there's somebody growing rye in Kentucky? So I went down there to meet with them. Well, I emailed them first, and I think they thought it was a joke, because <laughs> they were like, who's this person that says they're a distiller <laughs> contacting me online? But after I went down there and we, and we talked, they were like, oh, okay, this is real. So they have an experimental grain field where they're growing thousands of different varieties of wheat, particularly uh, it's a partnership with the University of Kentucky. And what they've done for us is work with the University of Kentucky to start developing seed of, of a heritage grain, a heritage variety of white corn specifically, that would have been similar to what Colonel Taylor would have grown for that 1917 distilled sample. So. That would definitely be a non-GMO. There are some um, reasons why, you know, um, farmers choose to grow GMO corn as a disease resistant. You can pack a whole lot more uh, seed. It, the density that it grows is a lot higher, so you get what it comes down to is bushels per acre. Yeah, bush, bushels per acre. Um, if you're growing a, a GMO or a heritage variety, the, the bushels per acre is lower, so your price goes up, which is exactly what, what Pam was, um, was pointing to. So we're going to pay a higher price to give consumers, and I think can, this is really consumer-driven. They're looking to, you know, what's in it? I want to know. And, you know, we want to be able to be honest when we say we're choosing the best ingredients that, that we have available to us. Hmm. Victoria, did and, you? No, I just I thought Andrea said something. And the same thing for Maker's Mark. You know, we went back. Bill Sr. actually selected where he purchased grain from to create Maker's Mark based on soil conditions. So he went out and he was able to purchase corn around the Loretto site. When he needed to expand and expand his reach to get more corn, he went out into northern Kentucky and actually into southern Indiana and found farms that were located that had similar soil site composition. And that's what we studied and that's what we continue to receive grain from. Um, Maker's Mark bottled is bottled with non-GMO corn at this time. And I, I will add a, like a historical value to that. Um, the, during the the Great Depression, you know, there was, there was a lot of food shortages. Uh, during that mm -hmm. time, um, farmers and scientists were developing new strains of, of hybrid dent corn, and the distillers resisted that. So the distillers have a, have a kind of a, actually have a long history of trying to stick to the most original, pure source mm -hmm. of, of whatever grain it is that they are using. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you when you find out that a brand has moved to non-GMO, you can rest assured that is because they have to, you know, because there's, it's becoming more and more difficult for uh, corn farmers to stay in business because while these guys are requesting non-GMO corn, Oreo's not and all the other food companies are not. They may have one product that they use non-GMO for, but they have 700 others that they're just going with the cheapest available. So, so bourbon distillers are really true pioneers for kind of protecting uh, farmer seed rights. Uh, but that's going back into 1930s and 1960s agricultural politics. There's a little bit of that in my, in my book, Bourbon Curious. But with that said, <laughs> e e I could bore you all day with that stuff. But uh, ladies, I just have to say that it, it was my absolute honor to sit up here and what I thought was amazing discussion. And you guys, you all, you ladies are amazing. I just, I have no other words, but you are amazing. <laughs> Cheers. So that was my 2016 legend series at the Kentucky Derby Museum with um, Marianne Eves, Andrea Wilson, Pamela Hallman, Victoria McRae Samuels. Now, Pamela has since retired, 
And Marianne has uh, left Castle and Key as, and she is a consultant and a new mother. Wish her the very best. And they continue to open the door for women around the distilling business. And I am, I'm so proud of that night. Uh, I've done a lot of things to uh, try to promote and encourage diversity, especially amongst women in the distilling community. But that night was was really special for a lot of reasons. And one of those might be because I got to sip on some of that legendary old Taylor. It was so good. But make sure you're clicking subscribe. I got a lot more of these coming down the, down the pipe. I'm also soon to announce my best bourbons of 2020 so far. So you won't know about those unless you click subscribe and have your, hit the bell for notification. So thank you so much for joining me today at this one o'clock hour. I look forward to seeing you tonight, tomorrow, Sunday, and next week. Until then, remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used for hand sanitizer. Cheers.